Let's take a look at Warriors and Traders. I picked this up. This has been around for a couple of years, but uh, I picked it up from uh, CSI, Cool Stuff Incorporated. It had a sale. I had my eye on it, vaguely interested for a while. It's very beautiful. Um, sort of the color tonations and everything on the map. And it sounded like, eh, to somewhat, uh, some extent, kind of looks like uh, something. Trying to look, uh, the old Warrior Knights, or maybe uh, Blood Royale, the GW games, that uh, of kind of this, eh, not really historically based. Obviously, Warrior Knights less than uh, Blood Royale, but with you know a certain flavor to them allowing you to build empires, etc. And to some extent, I'm, um, I picked this up with an eye towards some kind of mega game that, you know, I use combining these, the ideas from all of them to make something truly horrendous, which of course I'll never actually do these days, but I still think, excuse me, my back spasming, uh, in those, those uh, terms. Okay. Um, so, what do you have? <laughs> uh, the core of this game is going to be, I've never played it before, uh, it's got some bad press in terms of the rules and maybe some other factors as well. Uh, the core of the game though is one where you're trying to collect victory points by kind of expanding your empire, not just physically. In fact, you have very few military units. These are your military units and then you have these fortresses. Uh, but there isn't a lot of terrain on the board to take. Um, but also technologically, where you're going to be trying to achieve certain tech uh, uh, advances on the tree. And uh, the initial setup is the entire board gets covered with these markers, which are uh, indications of territory that a player could own. And then these barbarian markers, uh, which are going to be the defending troops. In the capital countries, and there are eight capitals on the board, uh, the barbarian instead gets a slightly more powerful fortress. In fact, very much more powerful. It's got a 5-5 five, five combat and defense rating. Whereas these guys have asterisk, asterisk, and that's going to be determined by how late in the game we're playing, we are. Um, they start off fairly weak. But as countries become more and more powerful, the barbarians or un uncontrolled territories become also correspondingly more powerful and more difficult for you to expand into. So expansion looks like it's going to be more important early in the game and become harder as you go on. Of course, we'll see uh, because of uh, your technology is going to allow you to have better troops as you go on as well. Uh, but if you don't choose to uh, devote yourself militarily, uh, you may find yourself unable to expand your kingdom anymore. The victory conditions are going to be stipulated by this uh, chart here, which indicates uh, each province basically gives you victory points depending on the type of province. So a capital province, which is the ones with these crowns in them, is worth three. A trade center is worth two. That's going to have a kind of... Uh, a heraldic crown uh, on top of it, showing the hands coming together. Trade centers give other advantages as well, and every other province is only worth one. Each fort that you have on the board is worth three. Now, you could say, well, geez, there's no uh, victory point track. How do you keep track of all this? Okay, well, these guys tell you they're worth three each, and there's little markers to indicate each fort you build as you uh, build it and you start the game in a capital space, that's gonna be determined randomly in this game. I shuffled up, there's a deck of eight of these because there's eight. Now, on the other side uh, of the board, there's East Europe and there's a whole set of counters covering the Eastern European territories, a deck of cards for those. Um, and we're not playing that because, well, I'm kind of West Europe centric in concept when given the choice between the two, I'm going to take the West Europe first. The East Europe might be an interesting uh, board, uh, but I haven't really, I haven't played, so I can't really tell even if this one is. Uh, 
And let's see. Uh, you also get points. Uh, for every 10 gold that you spend, you get a victory point. And then there's these, as you do things that get you victory points, uh, permanent points, you just take them from the bank there. And that's these little medals. And they come in uh, 1, 5, and 20 denominations. Um, whenever you kill an army, you get a value equal to the strength of that army. If you kill a princess, you get one. If you kill a barbarian, you get one. No matter what the power of the barbarian, even if they go up in power, they're still only worth one each. And when you destroy a fort, you get three victory points. So you're taking those three victory points from the other player, and you get them. And then the goal of the game is to reach a certain number of victory points. Since I'm playing a six-player game, that goal is going to be 27 points. Now, at the beginning of the game, you have six victory points. So you're, you're not, you know, way off the chart on those. <coughs> and yeah, the player aid uh, sheet for the game is basically this small set of cards, which are printed in several different languages. Uh, You probably know my ideas of inefficiencies of that, uh, but economically, maybe packaging games uh, with player aids that are in different languages and more uh, efficient. In this case, they're putting them on cards, uh, which means that they're paying a certain printing cost separate from the rule book. The rule book's only in the language you buy it in. So it may be. Uh, an advantage to them to print in this way. The cards are kind of cool because it means that, hey, I'm interested in the military technology. Hand me that card. Uh, I want to make sure that I understand the victory conditions right now. So there's not just one player aid uh, that everybody's got to share, but there also are not really enough cards. Unless you speak multiple languages, in which case you can fish out the other cards for a full complement of players. You probably want to print out some player aids anyhow uh, to go with this. Okay. Um, the sequence of play is listed here, and I'll try to uh, remember kind of what the rules are here as I go. So the first thing you do is you feed your armies, and basically you're going to, oh, yeah. so your actual pieces on the board, here's one kingdom, the kingdom of Germany, which is this guy up here, the first guy I picked, the blue color, and he starts off with the castle that replaces the barbarian castle there and his four princesses. These are the only time you're going to get princesses. Princesses are kind of interesting. Princess is probably the wrong term for them. They're basically your administration uh, that you can control territories with, but they provide almost no defensive uh, benefit at all. And they provide no offensive ability. So they have a combat strength of zero, but they can take a hit point. Whereas the fortifications have a strength of five and can take five hit points, so they're quite powerful, but obviously non-mobile. Okay. Um, so where were we? Okay, you pay your upkeep. You have to pay the strength of your armies. At this point, you don't pay for fortresses or princesses, so you get away for free on the first turn of the game. But other times, you're going to have to pay based on the strength of the army, so the higher the value of the army unit, the twos and threes are going to cost you more uh, upkeep. Now that's going to be in food. You have several different resources in the game. At the beginning of the game you start with a gold, a weapon, and a food resource. And you also start with these three things which are going to be placed on your tech track. I haven't done that yet. Uh, I did the rest of the setup. These are excess barbarians. There's probably too many barbarians for the game unless the east map is much larger than I think it is. It looks like it has about the same number of provinces. Um, there's one other resource, production, which is these markers. Now they don't look absolutely the same. And one of the uh, issues that I have with this from sort of a first peek at the game is, wow, the components are hard to distinguish and it's hard to see what's going on, uh, both on the map and elsewhere in terms of things. Now there's one thing that might help on the map, which is the game came with, and I opened them up, but decided I, after, first I decided I wasn't gonna use them and then I decided, uh, I would give them a try and I put one piece in and I said, you know, this is going to be too much of a pain to be putting these in and taking them off as I play. I can probably keep track of what's where. Um, these little stands, I guess you're, it doesn't explain what you're meant to do with them. Uh, but I guess what you do is you put your, your armies and maybe even your castles on them. It really kind of helps jump out where players have pieces. I think I can keep track of that, but it might be hard for you to follow 
hey, such is life. Um, a lot of people have covered this game so far. So, you know, having the blue pieces standing up from a distance, it would be more clear where they are. Just like with the GMT uh, games like uh, Napoleonic Wars there, which, you know, have pieces standing up for the military leaders. Except that all the pieces are going to be standing up except the barbarians in this case, or something, who knows. <laughs> However many you want to put little markers on, under. Okay. Um, so now the next step in the game at this point would be to select where these go. And they basically fill little boxes here. Now these boxes get more complicated as you go on. So this one goes in the three box, then one goes in the two box, then one goes in the one box, and you've made the next level. And you have to fill out the levels before you. So you start off with three of these, and you may want to improve uh, across the board, or you may want to focus on one area or another. And we'll, I'll probably try to do a mix of strategies just to get a little bit of flavor for how those each work out. Um, okay, then you gather resources. Now, uh, this is going to be based on your province uh, chits. They're going to tell you what they bring. So this brings, uh, I hope none of these say two on them. This brings a weapon and a product for owning this territory. And you're just going to get those extra chits in your pool. Now, at the end of the turn, you have a storehouse limit, which is I think 20 of each type of counter. If you don't, if you uh, try to stockpile too many counters, uh, you'll just ha lose the excess. But at this point, you don't have to worry about that yet. You will have to use some during the game. Um, none of the provinces are going to give you gold. However, gold can become can be uh, be gained through either the production tax which comes off the production technology up here. Yeah, we're not going to be seeing gold for a while from that source. Um, and you all, uh, and then the trade tax, which is a lot easier to get to. Uh, well, no, not a lot easier. Huh. And they say, here's something else. Trade technology, oh, okay, gotcha. And that'll give you gold for trade centers. The production will give you gold for your capitals. Okay, the next thing you hit is trading with the bank. Okay. Yeah, you get two kinds of trade that you can make. You can trade with other players or you can trade with the bank. At the beginning of the game, you can't trade with any other players, uh, but you're allowed to trade with the bank, and you've got these multipliers that you can use. So seven of one product will get you one of another product. Is that seven of any one product, or can you mix them? Yeah, it has to be of one type. Um, and that kind of reminds you a little bit of some of the, the trading ports in, say, Settlers of Catan. Um, so what about trading routes? Uh, in order to make a trade route, a player must uh, be allowed to open a, set, uh, a, set, a trade set uh, due to his trade technology. So when you get your first trade technology, you can open up a trade route with one other player. And that allows bilateral trades between those two players for the rest of the game. There's no tokens to uh, handle this, so we're going to have to figure out uh, some clever way of keeping track of who can trade with whom. I'll probably use some kind of colored tokens or something to indicate who you have open trade routes with. You also have to keep track of who started that trade route because that is something that is... Uh, uh, a limited commodity, the routes themselves. So, for example, if I reach trade route, the one trade route level, and I open up a trade route from Denmark to Burgundy, I committed that trade route to that. That can never change. Uh, I'll have to get another trade route if I want to trade with someone else or convince them to open the trade route. So that's kind of an interesting little uh, concept in the game that I haven't seen anything quite like before. Okay. 
Then we go to uh, uh, the development stage. And you're going to be allowed to take two actions. And these are done kind of serpentine. Uh, the first player, hey, who goes first? I'll have to try to find that. I think it's a fixed uh, order game, though. <coughs> the first player um, is allowed to choose an action. And then the second player all the way around to the last player. And then the last player chooses another, and you work your way back. And then, starting with the first player, any extra bonus actions get taken all at once, going around the table again. Uh, those actions are uh, not listed here. I suppose they're only listed in here. Okay, you can upgrade a technology. You can build an army, build a fort, upgrade an army, or declare war. Now these are not going to be discussed right away. They're kind of buried in things. Um, so in order to reach technology, I believe you have to pay the cost. There, no, that's bonus. Okay. In order to uh, pay a technology, what do you do? You have to pay something for everything in it, uh, I think. <laughs> well, I don't see it. the different technologies and what they give you. Uh, okay, well, gosh, I don't see anything there. Ah, here we go. Here we go to the actions back. Explaining them here. Upgrading a technology. Doesn't look like it costs anything, except your action. Because they don't say anything, but who knows. I guess it doesn't cost anything. Uh, building an army is an action. Um, you base this will be based on your military technology chart as to what you can have. So at the beginning you're allowed infantry. Later on you'll be allowed to build archers, and then finally you're going to be allowed to build cavalry once you clear all the little pips up to there. Now, what's that going to cost? That's going to cost the associated cost. Great! Do they tell you that? Yes, they tell you that on this card. Uh, and it should be on the military itself. So these cost one weapon. These cost two weapons and I think a gold. That's a Fleur de Lis. <laughs> No, they're not on the counters themselves. So this is the one thing in the game that gives you that rule. Because it's not in the rule book. <laughs> Great, huh? Yeah. These rules were not, you know, well designed. There's no question there. But that's a, uh, a given when you pick this up. You could build a fort. Um, you have to be at level four in your production technology and have masonry ability. You'd think that would say fort. No, it says masonry. And then that costs 12 product, 2 food, and a gold to build. Very little gold. That's odd. Um, you may not build more than 2 forts in a given province. Uh, you can upgrade armies. You have to have level 5 in the production technology to do this. And what that says is you turn in seven of your products <coughs> per level of upgrade you want to do on the army. So if you're moving infantry to archers, that would cost you seven production. If you're moving archers to cav, same thing. But if you want to jump infantry all the way up to cav, that'll cost you 14 production. But it only costs you one action to do that. So that's kind of cool. You can declare war. At that point, two players are no longer a piece. How do they become a piece again? You know, I didn't see that in the rules. Uh, okay.
the war ends. Ah, yes, I did see it. Uh, if players agree to peace, if at the end of a turn no damage is dealt, and a war only lasts three turns maximum. But you can declare war immediately afterwards again as an action, or you could actually declare war during a current war against uh, the participant in the war in order to extend the war. It doesn't add three turns, it just starts the clock over again. Um, if you don't have something useful to do for an action, but you want to continue with the war, that, that's a possible good, good thing to do. Okay, the next thing we get to is the maneuver phase, and this is where combat actually takes place. You'll be moving armies, resolving battles. You may upgrade one tech at the cost of a, uh, hold on. One tech at the cost of another tech. We missed that. Uh, let's see. Upgrading one technology. After all players have taken their actions, um, in the same order, you're allowed to move one development token from the top of a technology to the top of another technology. So you'd be allowed to shift your technology slightly on each uh, action phase, just to help you take advantage of the current situation a little bit, but without you know completely reworking what your society is like. All right, back to maneuver. So first you're allowed to move armies, then you resolve the battles, and then you move your princesses. And this gets a little mixed up too. Armies are gonna have a certain number of action points. At the beginning of the game, they have two action points each, but that goes up to up to five uh, when you hit the top pro uh, production. And that action points are basically the amount of territories you can move, but fighting costs you an action point. You're normally only allowed to do one battle, but if you have double strike, you're allowed to do a battle, and then take another maneuver, uh, another maneuver um, continuation after that battle. So what you're going to be doing is moving all your pieces, not too hard there, paying points for the battles that you're resolving. But then if you have the double strike, you're going to need some kind of counter that's not included in the game. Although there do seem to be plenty of these, so you could probably use these as extra AP counters. Um, Maybe not. I'm playing a full six-player game, so uh, if anything should use them all up, it's this. And keep track of your remaining points with that in order to let you know what you can do after you fight your first battle. <clears throat> okay. No. Uh, and each player takes each of these full phases in action, in order, I believe. Players enter the maneuvering phase one by one from the lowest to highest on their country cards. Oh geez, that's gonna be annoying. I'm gonna have to rearrange who's where um, simply because these country cards, I, I, I wanna make sure I have um, a counterclockwise order to my game. So this guy will be going first on every turn uh, this guy, I guess, will be going second, and that's going to annoy the piss out of me. Okay. Um, so what do we have here? Yeah, it looks to me like each player takes their whole maneuver phase at once. I'm not sure that's what's intended. <coughs> Like I said, the rules are not well uh, presented nor defined. Like the actions, the development phase are pulsed. There's no question there. The trade phase is probably pretty much simultaneous. So that's not really an issue. <coughs> okay. Resolving battles... Basically, you do an amount of damage equal to your combat strength, and you get to pick which of your which enemies you do it to. In general, uh, the defense that they t have is how many hits they can take. And if you completely hit a unit, uh, you knock it out, you you destroy it, and you will get victory points for killing that army. Therefore, fighting even you know without gaining anything can be glorious and valuable to you and might be a good way to generate points and might be something you want to agree with someone to do. 
Um, now, there are some special cases with that, which is once you have the commander ability here, and these are all spelled out here. We'll go over them in a little while. This has armies can retreat. What that means is if they take a number of hits that, that take them exactly to zero, uh, they can actually retreat to an adjacent area. So you actually have to do an extra hit to them, which isn't well uh, explained on the card, but it is clear enough in the rules. We'll go over all these specials when, when uh, we're done with the base rules. Uh, you start with princesses at the beginning of the game. They allow you to control an area. They have very weak defense strength, no attack strength, and they can only move one territory per turn. So they're not going to be your vanguard. They're going to be stuff that you kind of use to control territories where you don't want to have to spend military on them, but where there's no risk of the enemy uh, expanding into you. And early in the game, they'll be valuable too, because if I conquer a territory, I don't have the money to maybe support an army to hold it, but there's nobody around me who can threaten it. I'm assuming that these, this isn't explained in the rules, are uh, naval connections or adjacency between territories. That's what they look like. I don't know if this means that you can turn. <laughs> uh, that would seem to make sense, but who knows? Um, anyway. Like I said, barbarians change their strength over the course of the game. They have fixed rules as to who they sh hit. They go for the heaviest units first that they can damage, full, that they can destroy or retreat. And then they have their own rules for how they're going to retreat uh, if they're given the opportunity to retreat. They always retreat. Hmm. I wouldn't have assumed they have the retreat ability because retreat only happens if you have uh, the commander ability, which seems a little odd to me. Well, let's see. Okay. After the battle, the units, uh, if their units are left on the field, the attacker has to pull all his units back into adjacent provinces which belong to him or that are free. Um, if not, if there are no such places somehow, uh, his units die. I don't know how that could be possible. Um, you keep damage on you. Again, something we're going to have to use some kind of counters to mark with. Maybe these suckers here. Uh, until the end of the turn, which means if one person attacks you, somebody else can attack you and finish your unit off. I'm assuming barbarians have retreat capability automatically because otherwise uh, the fact that they have retreat rules for them don't really make sense. Unless I'm missing something about retreating. Here, retreating rules. The armies belonging to a player are able to retreat. You know, it doesn't. There's a barbarian section. They always have the ability to retreat. Great. Okay. Um, so there's something I left out early on in the game, or in the rules which is you have a set of territories listed on your card that kind of indicate the extent of your kingdom and that's going to be divided into different types of territories. The capital is listed here, a trade center if one, uh, regular territories, and then these which are contested territories that other players have. At some point in the game, if I can find it, at any point in the game in which you have um, all the non-contested territories. Here we go. You can declare that you're unifying your country um, during your maneuver phase. And you'll get a, a bonus number of actions for unification um, based on the number of provinces 
that you currently control in that country. Now, you have to, like I said, get all the non-contested zones. And then however many contested zones you have also add to this total. And, and you get just these bonus number of actions that obviously you can use, you know, at the very least to improve your tech, but perhaps to do some other things that are really cool. So that gives you kind of an, uh, an early goal to work for um, in terms of control that's going to give you territories that are, that are of some value. All right, I think that's most of the game. There's one thing I didn't explain that I'm aware of, uh, which is there's two different kinds of game you can play with this. You can play an alliance game where uh, two or three teams are competing with each other instead of players, and they compete for victory uh, together and essentially collect their victory points together going for these um, al full alliances that are involved in wars, etc. They suggest that that's better for more advanced players. Personally, I find it difficult to sit down to a game with fixed alliances like that of this nature. I, I, I think that uh, would create a certain level of distaste for me. My uh, video battery is running out, so we're gonna call this here and we'll get to the playing. I'll start off with uh, assigning some of these and maybe some explanation as to why I chose one over another, but it's probably not too big a deal. I'm hoping that they all kind of balance out, although some of these abilities may be better early in the game than others. For example, military is gonna give me the ability to build better troops right away, which could be very helpful against the barbarians, and maybe you just need to follow certain paths early on. I don't know. 